Good evening and welcome. On behalf of Stanford's Cancer Supportive Care Program, I'd like to um, welcome you to this evening's lecture, Nutrition-Related Supplements, The Good, The Bad, and The Unknown, and our two speakers for the evening, Natalie Chan and Erica Connor. Good evening. Thank you, Sarah. I'm Natalie. I'm a dietitian at Stanford. I've been working with Stanford for almost two years this April. Um, I'm a certified nutrition support, support clinician, so I help patients that um, are unable to eat through tube feedings or IV nutrition. Um, and this is Erica. Hello, everybody. I um, recognize a few faces out there, so thanks for coming. Um, my name is Erica Connor. I am also a registered dietitian and am certified specialist in oncology. Um, I have been a dietitian for over 17 years and oncology specialist for over eight, and I've been with Stanford for over 13. So, um, and Natalie and I are both at the South Bay location. So. Um, I'm hoping we can uh, save questions for the end because we actually have a lot to cover. So we want to get going so we don't, you know, miss out on anything and we can just kind of pack it all in for you guys. So, all right. Um, okay, so um, we have no disclosures. Um, what claims have you heard? So this is really always kind of an interesting piece. Um, if it's natural, it's safe, right? Um, it boosts the immune function. Um, it's a must have for cancer. Uh, if it could hurt you, they wouldn't allow it. That's always a good one too. So um, that and a lot more that are out there. I've probably heard a lot, everything under the sun of why somebody comes in and they have a supplement and why they, they need to take it or, or they've been told by somebody else that they need to take it. Um, what you'll learn tonight, um, quite a bit, uh, discussing the current use of um, the dietary supplements that we're going to talk about, define what a supplement is, discuss the safety, um, the popular supplements. There's more than this, so we <laughs> just grabbed onto these. Um, uh, we're not going to cover probably everything on your wish list, um, but we tried to cover a lot of the main questions that we actually get and that we see a lot of people taking. So um, to identify the possible interactions with treatment and other medications, and then to identify available resources. Um, so one thing that I do wanna share with you guys is just also to remind you that we are definitely on your side. Um, we are, we, we, we do our very best to gather all the research we can to find out, um, you know, and we're very supportive of, um, Complementary therapies. Um, oftentimes, we actually are the kind of kind of the gatekeeper when you go to your physician and you have a list of things that you're taking, and they say, "Oh, um, it's not uncommon for them to say, oh, 'Oh, I'm going to hand this to Erica and Natalie to take a look at,' um, where we can kind of dig into some of that, and we're constantly looking at new research and things like that. So um, that's what we're sharing with you tonight. So. Um, hopefully it, it, you like what you hear. Um, so a couple things as far as the definition um, of supplements is, um, and there is actually, believe it or not, a Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act. Um, products taken by mouth that provide ingredients intended to supplement the diet. They may include vitamins and minerals, herbs and botanical pro products, amino acids, and other nutritive and dietary supplements. Um, so, these guys, they assigns the responsibility for ensuring that products are safe, basically. Um, the FDA is responsible for taking action against any unsafe products. So, that's kind of the FDA's, um, you know, role in this. Um, they need to know of any, any unsafe uh, product, though. So, any kind of side effects and things like that, which we'll go into a little bit more. Um, what are dietary supplements made of? Uh, vitamins, minerals, herbs, or products made from plants, as you, as you well know. Animal parts, possibly. Um, algae, seafood, yeasts, fungus. Powdered amino acids, enzymes, energy bars, liquid food supplements. So a lot of different, a lot of different things. Um, 
widespread use. Um, these are a little older studies, um, but I've also found that they, they look at these percentages as far as um, uh, finding how many you know, people are taking supplements. Um, so in 2004, uh, the Mayo study found that 80, over 80% 80 of patients enrolled in early phase chemo um, use supplements, vitamins, herbs, minerals, things like that. Um, in 2005, same thing as far as um, looking at, um, they, they found that 65% six, six, of patients receiving chemo also took dietary supplements, not including vitamins. In 2007, they actually looked at the same thing and about approximately the same percentage came, came about. Um, and what also they found is that actually most patients do not tell their physicians also. So that's a huge piece of it. And I really want to encourage you and I want to encourage who other, you know, patients that you know, other people that you know, to really please let your physicians know um, what you want to take, what you are already taking. Um, it's really important uh, for sure because even if they can't answer a question for you, they can always find somebody who can and can try. So that's really, um, really important. Um, because as far as, as low as 30, and, and it's, this is actually a wide range, 32 to 69% of cancer patients and survivors reported, um, uh, reported the supplement use to their physicians, which is huge, but there's a couple variables there, is, you know, really what kind of communica communication there was. Is the 69% because the physician actually asked, and the other 32% was like, not going to say anything, you know. So those are the kind of big, good, big factors to, to think about, um, because there are quite a few that you'll actually learn tonight that are do look like they have interaction with chemotherapy drugs. And Natalie's going to take it from here. So next we'll talk about the safety profile of dietary supplements, so namely where are these supplements made. So some of these supplements are made in really clean, safe, controlled labs um, where all the ingredients are safely labeled, and some of them aren't. Some of them are not made in the cleanest labs or settings. Um, some dietary supplements have been found to have none of their ingredients that were listed on the labels. And some uh, supplements contain other su substances, like fillers, that have been shown to actually cause harm. Manufacturers are legally responsible to tell the FDA if there's been a reported adverse effect from their product. Unfortunately, manufacturers, so people that are making these products, don't have to prove to anyone that their product is safe or that it's actually effective for its claims before it's out on the market for you and I to purchase. So you and I, consumers, um, we have the responsibility to let the manufacturer know if there is an adverse event after taking their products. We can also report to uh, MedWatch. MedWatch is a reporting program. It's a system um, that's open to the public and the medical community about dietary supplements and their safety. In 2011, over 1,700 um, adverse reports uh, were made to the FDA. Um, and in 2013, over 100,000 calls were made to U.S. poison control centers about you know, dietary supplements and um, things that happened. Um, but really the key thing here is that researchers believe that a lot of these adverse effects have, are underreported, so several people are probably not calling it in. Um, so that number is probably way more than reported. One of the most common questions I get from patients is, is this product safe to take while I'm undergoing treatment, whether that be chemotherapy or radiation? Um, really, if you only take one message home from today, and Erica really drove it home, but it's really just to talk to us, just let us know, whether it be your doctor, your dietitian, or pharmacist, there's always someone that's willing to look at something that you're already taking or trying, wanting to take, um, even if you bring the actual products into your visits, we're more than happy to look that over and look over your own medications and see if it's something safe for you to take. 
um, herbal agents may interact and decrease the level of chemotherapy or other medications and their effectiveness, which can lead to treatment failure. Um, with radiation, some supplements can cause severe skin reactions um, or other sensitivities. Um, and then safety concerns, you know, we went over that some of the ingredients aren't actually in the product, um, but there can be also contamination with other toxic agents, um, and also the unknown, really co different combinations of different medications and different supplements. Those are unknown, so we really want you to talk to us and let us know if there's something that you're thinking about taking. So next I'm going to go over the good, the bad, the ugly for supplements. So the good supplements, for the most part, are most vitamins, um, a multivitamin that has a low potency. So in this age, we're always thinking more is better, just take more, it'll be more powerful, work better. It's not necessarily true. We actually recommend a multivitamin that contains less than or equal to 100% of what's recommended daily um, of most of its ingredients. As far as the vitamins go, um, high doses of vitamins A, D, E, and K are not recommended because those are not easily excreted. So if you're using high doses, that can lead to toxicity. Um, and selenium, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, glucosamine for joint health, melatonin for sleep, and probiotics for digestive aid are probably safe to take. As far as the bad goes, I would say any herbal supplement taking in concurrent with other, any type of medications is probably a moderate risk for a supplement, especially if you're taking any type of blood thinner, uh, blood pressure medication, diabetes medications, and you'll see chemotherapy listed as well. Um, iron supplements we don't recommend taking unless you have a deficiency. Um, Reservatrol we don't usually recommend taking. Um, weight loss supplements, any supplements that are sold via pyramid scheme. Um, and if something has an exaggerated claim, like it's a miracle drug, um, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true, right? I'm going to add a few things about uh, the resveratrol. Um, a little side note, since we don't have a total slide on it, but some interesting things, because this is actually another one that pops up quite a bit. Um, it's a, it's a very popular um, supplement with regard to heart disease. A um, couple things, uh, it's, it's actually, um, it's a hydroxystilbene, that's what it is. It's just fun to say. Um, but that's actually um, a naturally occurring in nuts, grapes, pine trees, um, and certain vines, like red wine. I actually have to um, read this piece of one of the side effects of resveratrol that I thought was interesting. Consumption of large quantities of red wine as a source of resveratrol is considered unsafe due to the alcohol content. <laughs> and I think, oh my, I hope people aren't really <laughs> thinking that, oh, but it's in red wine, so the more the better. No. Um, it has been safe um, with regard to heart disease in some dosages, in lower dosages, um, typically about like 250 milligrams. However, in the cancer world, we have to be careful because what you'll hear tonight also is a couple other um, supplements that interact um, with a certain and it's a little bit scientific, but certain pathways that other medications take, um, which is actually called the cytochrome P450 substrate, which is if, if you've done any research on any supplements and that pops up, that pathway shares, it's basically it shares the pathway with a lot of other medications, including um, other herbs, but also um, things like Prilosec, um, Prevacid, oxaliplatin, which is um, a chemotherapy, um, Tarceva, um, Paclitaxol, Paxi um, and what I call the VINs, like the vincristine, vinblastine, those types of medications. So actually quite a few uh, chemotherapies that are, whether they're human models or mouse models, is a little bit questionable. So I just wanted to leave a little um, 
tidbit on the risk for air trawl for you. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so for the ugly, the high risk supplements, St. John's wort and ginkgo bilboa, um, these two herbal supplements um, go through that same pathway that Erica is talking about. So um, it can increase how quickly the liver breaks down certain medications, therefore decreasing its effectiveness. Um, so medications that are affected by these herbal supplements are anti-rejection medications for the transplant uh, population, any HIV drugs, any cancer therapies, oral contraceptives, anti-seizure medications, medications for the heart. Um, so that can really be several of us in the population. So we don't recommend taking ginkgo and St. John's wort. Um, herbs that are imported from countries of concern may have high levels of um, contamination and toxic agents. Um, so that may include herbs imported from China. Um, apricot kernel, we don't recommend to any of our patients because it can contain a source of cyanide, which is a toxic chemical. It's, um, it's a poison, and it's been shown to cause acute poisonings that can lead to respiratory failure or coma and ultimately death. Um, any energy drinks marketed as a dietary supplement is a high-risk supplement. Um, and four of the ones that I found that are really high risk are cesium chloride, bloodroot, uh, chaparral, and colloidal silver. Um, these four supplements have been shown to have effects ranging from nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, permanent skin discoloration, kidney cysts, kidney cancers, liver damage, um, increase uh, or increased loss of potassium in the body, um, which can change your, your heartbeat. Um, so those are not recommended as well. And we'll just save um, questions until the end, sorry. Uh, so for antioxidant supplements and cancers, here we're talking about supplements, right? So pill form, not antioxidants from food. This is a controversial topic. Um, some research say that antioxidant supplements can be harmful. Some say they could be beneficial. So some say that taking antioxidant supplements while undergoing cancer treatments can reduce the effectiveness of its therapy, so it can protect the cancer cells. Some research has been shown that taking antioxidant supplements during cancer treatment can protect the healthy cells and decrease the side effects that come along with chemotherapy. Um, the bottom line here is that we need more research to build a stronger recommendation from us, um, from the medical community. However, the good news is that there is really strong evidence out there that supports a diet um, high in fruits and vegetables or a diet high in antioxidants from whole foods to decrease the risk of certain cancers. So next we'll go into common supplements. So these are supplements that Erica and I are asked about all the time um, and give you evidence-based information about them. So vitamin D and calcium are popular supplements um, studied for the cancer population. Um, researchers found that in certain areas um, where there's more sun exposure, those places had lower risks of certain cancers. So they wanted to study that. Um, they found that their higher intake of vitamin D in the diet or higher levels of blood of vitamin D have been associated with reduced risk of colorectal cancers, may be helpful to prevent breast cancers. Um, they found that calcium might be protective against certain cancers such as colorectal, but also some studies actually show um, a relation between calcium intake and increased risk for prostate cancer. So again, we need more research to build a strong recommendation for taking this for that um, purpose. Currently, we recommend um, repleting, so fixing any vitamin D deficiencies um, for patients before treatment and after treatment of cancers. Um, people that might benefit from vitamin D and calcium supplements are people that have a deficiency, um, and that's really common nowadays that we're spending more time inside, on a desk, at work, um, people with osteoporosis or osteopenia, um, and people taking certain medications such as steroids may have a higher risk for osteoporosis, so may benefit from supplementation. 
Research suggests that an optimal calcium absorption occurs when um, there's a certain blood level of vitamin D in the body. Um, so we recommend rec for calcium to take at least 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams a day, broken up to two to three doses in a day. Um, and for most people, uh, vitamin D of 2,000 international units is um, recommended. But it's also safe up to 4,000 IUs per day. You just want to talk to us and get your level checked um, to get a recommendation. Okay. Fish oil. Oh, what a, and I apologize the si slide is a little bit packed with information, but um, there's a lot of information about fish oils. And uh, again, I think that we share the frustration um, with everybody of, you know, one day it's good and the next day it's uh-oh. Um, so here's some tidbits um, with regard to the fish oils. Um, so. You know, people use this for fish oils for a number of different things, um, reducing inflammation, um, anti-cancer properties, which is basically why people are here, um, but also high cholesterol levels, arthritis, um, depression, and many, many more. Um, the effectiveness, so possibly effective. So there's reasons also why we are using certain terminology because this is actually what's found in um, the, you know, the, the research studies um, and as far as other resources that we'll share with you at the end with regard to, um, you know, just overall supplement use. So possibly effective in cancer-related cachexia, um, which is, uh, cachexia is, is basically a syndrome um, where you are losing muscle mass um, with regard to a number of different reasons, um, not enough calories, not enough protein, um, uh, hypermetabolism, a lot of uh, different reasons um, with regard to um, cancer-related cachexia. Um, so this has been shown to be actually quite effective, um, but also with a protein supplement. Um, it's also possibly effective in endo endometrial cancer. The interesting thing with that is a lot; those studies predominantly show not necessarily supplementation, but eating fish. Um, likely ineffective in cancer prevention, and I'll go over that a little bit. Um, it's also, you know, again, fish oils have actually been um, around for a long time, and people generally use them to for cholesterol levels. So it's um, actually a little bit more effective at reducing triglyceride levels, um, likely effective in cardiovascular disease. So, um, you know, there there's definitely some positive um, reasons why people would, would take it. Um, the likely ineffective for cancer prevention is interesting um, with regard to a number of different um, diseases, breast, prostate, colorectal. Um, the dosages used in research are also quite broad. Um, the general use, so, you know, again, you're not in therapy, those types of things. Um, the FDA, and again, most things say that about three grams a day um, is safe. So then we get into what some of these other dosages that were used in these research studies. So with cancer cachexia, they went up to seven, seven and a half to eight grams daily. You'll also notice that um, a lot of these uh, Dosages will also have a timeline as well. So, um, although this one doesn't necessarily, but they usually do it for anywhere from two months to as far as a year. Um, the other dosages, like I mentioned, the two servings of fatty fish weekly for the endometrial cancer. Um, fatty fish are going to be your mackerel and herring, are big ones, and then um, the sardines, as well as. Uh, tuna and salmon, again, salmon's the big one, uh, and trout is another one. Um, you'll also get uh, the omega-3s, the EPA and DHA from whitefish as well. Um, generally, you'll see, though, that you may have to eat a little bit more of those to get up to those ranges, um, but they're still in there. Um, otherwise, dose ranges from anywhere from 600 milligrams to 3.6 grams um, of 
EPA and or DHA. And let me tell you, when you're reviewing these research, you know, kind of the research information and the results, your head will spin, my head is spinning, everybody's head is spinning. It, unfortunately, we just, we need more information um, because, I mean, you're looking at these range and then, you, then my initial response is, what do I tell my patients? This is, ah, uh, I don't even know where to start with it, you know? So, um, but this was interesting because they actually, they have been looking at and they are continuing to look at the use of fish oils during chemo and or radiation, but it, it showed actually that more effectiveness in preserving the body composition, so again, your muscle mass, and no difference in tumor size or overall survivor, survival. So, um, so again, that's, you know, a, yeah, just I wish I had a more straightforward answer for you. Some potential concerns which again, some people have thought, and for a long time, I even thought, ah, oh, everything is coming out good in a lot of these research. Yeah, we gotta, get, we gotta be careful. So um, it can absolutely increase bleed, um, the risk of bleeding, um, especially if anybody's on anticoagulant drugs. So you know your Coumadin, um, Lovenox, Plavix. Um, it can lower blood pressure, um, especially those who already are taking antihypertensive, so your Diavan. Um, all those are listed. Um, recent concern in a mouse study with platinum-based chemo. So that is cisplatin, carboplatin, oxaliplatin. This was actually interesting and um, again kind of got to me um, because this showing resistance to these chemotherapy agents, my initial thought was, oh, no. Don't let it be. But then I went and said, it's a mouse model. Okay. But I actually do have some colleagues who are suggesting to avoid the supplement and even eating fish a day before chemo and then anywhere from two to three days after chemo because of this mouse study. So, again, it's how caught, you know, that's where I want to stay, you know, step forward and say, this is the information that we know. We have to proceed with caution if you want to choose to take it, you know, but it's our responsibility to share this information with you. So, um, so that's a, an important piece. More studies are underway, and I can't wait to the, for those to come out. Because there have been very um, positive studies with regard to fish oil supplements enhancing um, pulmonary strength and endurance in women undergoing chemotherapy as well. So that was actually a strong study that came out um, yeah, just recently, in, um, back in June, actually was published. Um, that was actually, that was, again, very positive, um, but then we have this mouse study that we're a little nervous about. Um, the other interesting thing, too, is the GLA, the gamma linoleic acid, which is actually an omega-6, um, may increase the effects of other drugs. The doxorubicin, cisplatin again, carboplatin. So there's our concern. Um, the conflicting evidence about the role in cancer prevention, again, is frustrating. The let me explain, I kind of already did that um, to just share kind of the frustration with this. Um, we're looking forward to more studies. There are more, you know, there are more studies coming. Generally, what I would say is if somebody came to me, I would say, are we on any of these drugs? Is there any concern with this? And if not, okay, then we look beyond that. Um, but if you are, we have to be careful. Okay. Okay. Moving on to coenzyme. Okay. So for coenzyme Q10, that's just an antioxidant. It's a substance found in every cell in our body. Um, people have claimed that this can be used for increasing energy, reducing the toxic toxicity of adriamycin, um, and used for breast cancer. So right now there's insufficient reliable evidence for these claims, but I did find some early research that shows that taking coenzyme Q10 along with other antioxidants may increase survival rates 
um, by 40% for patients with end stage uh, certain cancers. The dosages found in research, so toxicity is low, um, but we don't recommend using more than 3,000 milligrams or three grams taken daily over a long period of time. Um, for known deficiency of coenzyme Q10, which is pretty low, um, certain research says to take 150 milligrams per day. Um, Certain side effects that can come along with taking the coenzyme Q10 are GI effects, so nausea, vomiting, some diarrhea. Um, also common, you'll hear this with the other supplements, um, but it may reduce blood pressure, um, may decrease the effectiveness of certain chemotherapies since it's an antioxidant, similar to that last slide about antioxidant supplements. Um, so it may reduce the effectiveness of your therapies. Um, and it may increase blood levels of certain vitamins as well. I have the, another big hot topic of the curcumin and uh, turmeric. Um, interesting thing, so turmeric um, is the main spice. And then within turmeric, there's over 300 compounds and curcumin is one of those popular compounds. Then there's many other curcuminoids that are that are have also been looked at and you know kind of basically related to the curcumin. So there's a there's a, a long tiered effect with regard to the turmeric. So um, people use the this both of these. Um, for, a, again, a lot of um, possible benefits. Um, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancer properties, indigestion, arthritis, and actually diabetes as well. Um, so the interesting thing as far as the um, effectiveness is possibly effective in reducing inflammation and improving osteoarthritis. Shows pretty promising with that. Reducing cholesterol and improving puritis, which is an itching. Um, and then we get into this. Insufficient reliable evidence, yet promising. I have to say, it looks very promising. Um, at preventing cancer, slowing the spread of cancer, making chemotherapy more effective, and protecting healthy cells from damage by radiation therapy. I had a conversation with a colleague of mine uh, who works in another state, and she, as well as somebody else who who works in California, and said, "We have a feeling that it probably is going to be years from now, but I wouldn't be surprised if curcumin ends up being part of some cancer therapies. I wouldn't be surprised. There's a lot of studies that needs to be done still, but." Um, it, it may fit very well in certain populations. Um, interesting thing, though, before I go on with regard to um, b both turmeric and curcumin, is it has a very low bioavailability, which basically means it's not absorbed in tissues very well. It actually, um, they think that it has so many great benefits with regard to and you'll kind of see in some of these that um, with like colon cancer and some of the digestive cancers, because as it goes down and it, you know, you're digesting it, it basically kind of stays in with, within the digestive system and it's not absorbed very well outside of that. Um, it also basically has a, what's called kind of a short half-life. So it doesn't stay in our system for very long either. We actually excrete it um, pr fairly quickly. Um, so, their researchers have also been looking at ways to increase the bioavailability of that. So, you might have heard that, oh, well, if you have turmeric, that you need the black pepper with it, um, which is true, because it actually helps, to, helps the absorption. Um, the other thing is the quercetin, which is um, another bioflavonoid, um, actually from the onion. Uh, they're looking at um, the importance of possibly having the turmeric, you know, and the quercetin um, together as well. So I do, I have good feelings and their researchers are working, they're, they're working hard on this. Um, 
So the dosages used in research, again, you're going to find quite broad. Um, diabetes, um, 750 milligrams twice daily for nine months. So again, you're going to see a lot of a time frame. Don't think that you're on this and you're on it forever because we don't want to do that. Arthritis, very, very um, positive results. Um, 1,500 milligrams daily of curcuminoids times six weeks. And I'll kind of get into the different types and, um, you know, um, what to take and ugh, all of that. Um, for cancer, 4,000 milligrams, so 4 grams, of 98% curcumin daily times one month. Now, this was in smokers to help prevent colon cancer. Very favorable results. Um, and then up to 8,000 milligrams, so 8 grams, now, this is important to realize, too. As you've already noticed, one's is curcuminoid, one's a 98% curcumin, and now this is whole food curcumin formulation. So this isn't a 98% extract or anything like that. So one of the other challenging things that we'll talk about with regard to these studies. So this was the whole food curcumin formulation was taken for two months. Now this was in advanced pancreatic cancer patients um, and showed very favorable results. Um, so incorporating turmeric in the diet is absolutely safe. Um, anything from a tea to, you know, there's um, great things you can do as far as with vegetables and obviously curries and things like that. Um, the, the, there are limited data, though, on the effects as far as with the combinations with conventional chemotherapy and radiation. So that's where we're lacking a little bit. And again, they're working hard because as far as some of the uh, potential concerns, um, excessive amounts may increase risk of bleeding um, when used with anticoagulants. That's going to be, if you haven't caught on already, it's a common trend with some of these. Um, as well as may decrease blood sugars, um, and digestive side effects include diarrhea, reflux, nausea, vomiting, um, headache also. Um, so the other thing, too, as far as in practice, we have actually seen um, decreased blood pressure and causes, uh, it, we've seen it cause um, elevated liver enzymes. Um, this actually was interesting when I talked to one of our pharmacists, and she said, yeah, we looked at the liver enzyme of one of the patients and said, oh, my gosh, what's happening? And it wasn't until then that he divulged, oh, yeah, I've been taking and said he was taking as far as a turmeric extract and um, large doses. He stopped it. His liver enzymes did return to normal. Um, but that's the type of thing where I even said, oh, I wonder if he's going to report that, <laughs> you know? Probably not, um, and it's unfortunate. But um, it, it's, it's one of those things where it does happen. Um, with regard to the blood pressure, I actually do know a physician who experiments on himself with some of these things, um, as I do as well. Um, and he actually, his blood pressure went down, and he was like, what's happening? <gasps> oh, it must be, and sure enough, was as far as their, their curcumin extract that he was experimenting with, um, he thinks is pretty much what caused the drop in blood pressure. So um, usually what I say, a little excerpt here, um, if you are going to try anything, literally mark it on the calendar or put it in your phone or mark it on something as far as you, so you know when you started to take it. Because if you start having a side effect, having that memory of well, when did I, when, what day is today, when did I take that, that might not go well. But if you put it on a calendar, that's something, um, you know, definitely a little bit better. The interesting thing, though, in some animal studies um, with regard to the turmeric and curcumin um, is it has shown to actually increase levels with um, some of the chemotherapies as far as the taxotere, abraxane. Um, and again, um, Increased level, what does that mean? Is that would we need to reduce your dose of chemotherapy? Is it enhancing it? In some studies, it actually showed that it enhanced the effect 
which could be a good thing, um, with regard to um, cisplatin and 5-FU. So again, there's the information. We're kind of in a conundrum here because it's, it's difficult to say exactly what's happening. Um, but again, it's, it's important to understand what's going on. With regard to some other um, medications too, Pepsid, Zantac, Prilosec, all those things that you're trying to calm your stomach acid, um, it might actually increase the production of stomach acid. Uh, so that is definitely questionable as far as using um, turmeric or curcumin with regard to some of these acid reducers. Um, so going back real quick on the types, that's the other thing I mentioned kind of you know, looking through the fish oil studies and looking at these broad, just huge, you know, areas of, well, anywhere from 600 to this. The turmeric and curcumin, um, the, the challenging thing with that is what was used in the study? Was it the actual spice? Was it um, an extract? Was it a standardized capsule? Was it the drug? Oy, oy, oy. It, um, so there's a lot of different, um, lots of different changes with regard to that on actually what was used in the study. Um, and what I've also found um, working with actually another um, oncology dietitian is some of the products that were actually used in the study, we as consumers can't find them. So they're like a specialized, you know, Stand, it could be standardized, but it's a specialized high dose product that possibly the company is providing for a study. Um, and we as consumers, we don't have, we can't get our hands on it. Um, so that's the other thing that I've actually, because I've actually looked things up um, saying, oh, they use this. Oh, where can we find that? Oh, you can't. Um, so that's the other really frustrating thing about this. Um, the last thing I will add with regard to turmeric and curcumin is again, here's that cytochrome P450, um, that interaction with these other, you know, possible, now I mentioned some of the uh, chemotherapies, but there we have it again as far as with um, adriamycin, uh, arenatecan. Um, that was one study that looked at actually human breast cells. Um, looking at possibly that, that, that the, uh, the turmeric and curcumin may, uh, you know, have negative effects with regard to some of these other chemos. So um, on the other note, though, it is promising on many other levels, um, and we may actually end up seeing this as part of um, therapies down the line because um, even though there's the negative, there's some really great um, things that this, um, this supplement can do. And I think in my practice, turmeric is the number one most popular um, supplement that I've been asked about. But I'm going to talk about ginger. Um, <laughs> so people use ginger for several different things, but what I'm going to focus on is chemotherapy-induced nausea vomiting. Um, ginger can also increase blood flow and saliva, digestive juices that may calm the stomach and the intestines, but we're going to talk mostly about nausea vomiting. So I found some evidence that suggests that ginger, taking ginger um, during chemotherapy can reduce severity and duration of nausea, but maybe not vomiting. Um, other analysis of clinical evidence that I found that said that ginger is probably no more than a placebo effect um, for nausea and vomiting. The dosages used in the research that I found um, are listed here. They used it for three days prior to the start of chemo and three days after chemo. Um, warnings, again, at the risk of sounding, you know, repetitive. Again, if you're taking any anticoagulant drugs, um, probably not a good idea to take large amounts of ginger supplements. Another thing too is if you know you're going to have a surgery or a procedure where you probably don't want a blood thinning effect, um, stop taking the, the supplements, um, including ginger. Um, it may reduce blood glucose levels for patients taking diabetes medications. Um, and then really, really interesting is ginger shouldn't be used 
concurrently with an anti-emetic and anti-nausea medication called Amend. So we found research um, showing an interaction between this anti-nausea medication and ginger that caused severe nausea and vomiting. So that was actually really interesting um, about ginger. I actually thought that was more than interesting with regard to ginger and amend because amend is a very effective anti-nausea medication and to take amend and then to get severe nausea and vomit I thought oh my like out of all things right that's too much too much okay astragalus how many people have heard about astragalus not many really okay because this is one of those things where I think it comes in waves. I get two weeks of everybody asking about astragalus, and then I get two weeks of nothing, and people don't know what it is. Um, I'm going to talk about it anyway. So astragalus is, um, it's actually, there's a, that's actually what it looks like. It's um, the, it, the root piece is what is used in kind of the medicinal supplement world. Um, people use it for anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties, um, cancer treatment related side effects, and fatigue. Um, the effectiveness, possibly effective in reducing uh, GI toxicity during chemotherapy, um, looks promising. Insuffi insufficient evidence um, for lung cancer treatment with platinum-based chemotherapies. There we are again. Um, the dosages, um, again, whew, I wish I had a better answer for this. Um, most dosing related um, to, with regard to chemotherapies was actually intravenous, so IV. Um, I will say I do know some integrative oncologists, and I don't know any here in California who do IVs. I know that there are some, but I don't know them. Um, so, but I know that the research is out there as far as, and they're doing more. They're looking actually at more oral, um, the oral dosing. Um, so 90, or 90 grams of astragalus daily um, times 30 days as an oral tincture um, has also been used. Um, the dosing of the tincture, again, will depend on the strength of the preparation. So, which varies. Um, dosing otherwise is unclear with a very wide range. And here we have it again, 20 to 500 milligrams of standardized extract. And that's actually anywhere from three to four times a day. Um, there's the safest way to go, <laughs> which um, is uh, a strong tea. And so three to five grams of a dried root um, for 12 ounces of water and three times a day. So you boil it down, basically. Um, Dr. Weil actually is a big advocate for astragalus when it comes to colds, so um, the cold and flu season. Um, so again, the dosing um, ugh, is, is tough. Um, possibly safe um, and dosages, you know, the possibly safe, and then we've got this huge range. Um, dosages used and suggested are very different. Um, hard to distinguish oral forms, a tincture versus capsule. Um, that, that's really tough. Um, most often, too, it's actually one of a, of a multi, it's like one component of a multi supplement, like a multi form supplement. Um, that's actually what I found quite commonly is it was astragalus and then all these other things and every once in a while, astragalus alone. So a lot of studies looking at a lot of the different things, but sometimes that doesn't really help us out. Um, so the precise dosing is obviously not clear. Um, most commonly for potential concerns, um, the, some side effects, diarrhea, mild GI effects. So again, mark your calendar so you know kind of what's happening. Um, May ex this actually was also very interesting. It may exacerbate some autoimmune diseases by stimulating the disease activity. So multiple sclerosis, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I actually do know somebody who, has, rheum who had, has rheumatoid arthritis and was asking about this. So um, 
uh, may reduce the effectiveness of auto uh, of um, immune suppressive drugs, so cytoxin, cyclosporin, prograf. Again, looking at um, history, you know, I mean, maybe you haven't had a transplant, but other people maybe have, and then they're going through cancer treatment. So, a lot of big range of, of medications being used, um, and then uh, it also may uh, affect the elimination of the drug lithium. There we go again. May a blood uh, uh, affect blood sugars and blood pressure as well. The other thing to remember too is even though we're listing drugs here with regard to blood pressure um, or blood thinning, important thing to remember, if these, if these supplements are mentioning, you know, the lower in blood pressure or lower blood sugar or the, um, the blood thinning effect, Remember that it's not only going to be affecting the drug and that kind of thing, it's other herbs as well. Um, so if you, I've actually had this happen where people were taking um, high doses of garlic, um, high doses of ginkgo, high doses of, you know, vitamin E at the time, things like that, which fish oil, I think fish oil was on the list too. Um, and then it was one of those things where you kind of you run into the door frame of the house or something, and all of a sudden you go, oh, my God, where did this bruise come from? You know, or it's kind of sneezing, rubbing your nose, and all of a sudden you got a bloody nose. Warning, something's, that's not good. <laughs> you got way too many interactions there or as far as things, not necessarily interactions, but things that are piling up on each other that are going to be blood thinners and things like that. So be careful. Okay, so speaking of garlic, um, several population studies wanted to look at garlic because they saw an association of increased intake of the whole food of garlic um, and reduced risk of certain cancers, so stomach, colon, esophagus, um, pancreas, and breast. So really they wanted to look at garlic supplements. Um, as far as effectiveness, they found that supplements don't offer the same benefit as above, but actually the whole food does. Um, and again, these are dosages used in research. Erica and I kind of played around with what terminology we wanted to use for that part. Or do we want to say this is the recommended dose? Do we want to recommend this dose? We decided these are just the dosages that they used in research, not really what we're recommending, but what they showed in their studies. Um, so those are listed below. Again, with garlic, there's that increased risk of bleeding, lower blood pressure, lower blood sugars, and interactions with the transplant population, people taking um, cyclosporin and those other immunosuppressive drugs. Mushrooms. I'm going to talk a lot again about, because there's a lot to talk about mushrooms. Um, and there's a lot of mushrooms. There's quite a few varieties. Um, I will say that the most popular ones are um, turkey tail, the reishi, maitake, and shiitake. Um, people use mushrooms for, again, a lot of different reasons. Um, mostly, um, I get the question of I, what can I do to help my immune system? Um, so, and it's, you know, used to boost the immune system and um, possibly supporting chemotherapy. Um, effectiveness. Um, we need more research. Did I say that again? <laughs> Did I say that yet? Um, so for the turkey tail, um, it's possibly effective. That's actually, this is probably the most um, promising one um, for improving the response and survival in some patients um, with cancer. So, and I'll kind of go over that a little bit. Um, with the others, it's insufficient evidence regarding use with cancers or other diseases and issues. Um, again, more so maybe promising. Um, the research that's been done so far is um, just a little weak, um, and then we need more of it too. So uh, that's something else that I wouldn't be surprised if we see that change um, down the line, but probably not too soon. Um, the thing about turkey tail, that turkey tail actually has been used in Japan for decades with breast cancer, um, as well as esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, a lot of many other, including leukemia. Turkey tail has um, a component, it's a protein-bound polysaccharide, which is called the PSK, and that's actually how turkey tail is dosed. 
um, and just really how it's actually, the PSK is actually cultured from the turkey tail mushroom. Then we get into, then there is a certain strain of that that um, is really the important piece of the PSK. Um, so dosages used in research is, has been about three grams of the PSK um, taken daily. Um, the duration is variable, and I mean variable. Again, anything from one month to a year, and some things were, I think there was one that was about two years. Um, there have been um, some cases, and I'm going to go over the, as far as the potential concerns too, but um, with the turkey tail primarily, there were actually three cases of toxicity that were noted in human studies, um, and the PSK was discontinued immediately. Um, that was mostly liver related. Um, the liver bounced back, and it was fine, and everything was fine, but um, it was enough to stop the study. Um, the, in November of 2010, there was a promising study where things looked good in um, breast cancer by enhancing the immune function in survivors. Um, so these are um, women who were finished with chemotherapy and radiation, and so they looked at um, using the turkey tail in survivors, and that actually was very promising, so I'm looking for, again, more studies, please. Um, and nobody had an adverse um, effect with regard to that. Um, also, some promising, um, maybe some promising news um, in lung cancer by slowing the disease progression. Um, so, you know, again, it, it's, it's, it's insufficient evidence because it's just not enough yet. Um, and so studies are underway as far as right now um, with regard to the turkey tail specifically. Um, with others, with the Rishi um, dosing, very broad again, 600 to 1,800 milligrams, and then three times a day times 12 weeks. Um, the maitake, 0.5 milligrams to 5 milligrams um, per kilogram extract. So that's very, that's little to really big, um, and that was for only three weeks. Um, and the shiitake is the extracts, at this point, the safety is unclear. Um, so I'm not suggesting uh, shiitake extracts at all. Um, the maitake, shiitake, and many other varieties, like the button mushroom, um, uh, are absolutely safe to eat and are great to add in to any kind of culinary um, dish that you'd like. Um, and mushrooms should always be cooked. That's an important thing. Dr. Weil will definitely tell you that, too. He's a big mushroom guy. Um, the reishi mushroom is not on the edible list because it's um, too woody um, and bitter to eat, so it's not very popular. Um, the reishi mushroom, though, has also been looked at um, at reducing colorectal cancers. So like I said, a little bit more research. We'll see what comes up. Um, it has been shown to not reduce lung tumors, um, but actually increase immune function and quality of life in, in uh, some studies. Um, the dose is unknown. Couldn't find that one, so that was kind of a bummer. Um, the maitake, um, 24 cases of mushroom poisoning in Japan. Yikes. Um, I didn't like to read that one. Um, the shiitake, again, no proposed uses um, of the mushroom or extracts um, supported by science at this point. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, we talked about, I already talked about, as far as the potential concerns, obviously liver toxicity, the GI upset, um, skin rash, dizziness, headaches are, are pretty big with the mushroom, um, but not necessarily that popular. The interesting thing about the mushrooms is actually the amazing um, number of people who are allergic to them. And maybe they don't realize it until they are told or they read, oh, the mushroom, I better have the mushroom. And then they turn out to be allergic to it. Um, it may increase again bleeding. Here we go with bleeding and blood sugars again and blood pressure. So there we have it again. Um, 
so a uh, lot of possibly, you know, some positive things about the mushroom, um, but again, not without some unfortunate risk. Okay, so now you're probably feeling just as conflicted <laughs> as we are about all the good and all the bad and then all the side effects. Um, so how can we be smart consumers? How can we choose and use supplements safely? Um, you really need to investigate before you use something. You shouldn't just pick something up and just take it just because the label looks nice. You should really, really, really talk to your medical team. Um, talk to Erica and I, your doctors, pharmacists, nurses. We're more than happy to go through all of that confusing, conflicting information for you. Um, check if the label contains someone to contact, a company to contact, a phone number. Um, avoid c products that claim to be miracles or breakthroughs or contain secret ingredients. Just don't fall for it. Avoid mixtures. So the unknown is really where you're taking several different medications, several different supplements, and you have some kind of side effect. That's the unknown. We don't know what is causing what. Um, don't use dietary supplements prior to surgeries or procedures. Um, follow the dosage limits. So again, more is not always better. Follow the directions on the label. I do want to point out these three labels here. Um, these three labels are actually seals of approval. So these are independent organizations that offer quality testing of different supplements. So these seals of approval provide assurance that the product was properly manufactured. So going back to what the labs looked like and how they made their products. Um, they contain the ingredients that are listed on the label and they don't contain harmful levels of contaminants. Um, in their products. So definitely look out for these labels on different supplements that you are looking at or already taking. As far as resources, um, there's several resources out there. Um, the National Center of Complementary and Integrative Health um, provides a really good website, Herbs at a Glance. You just choose an herb that you're interested in, and it provides just brief fact sheets about you know, their use, their effectiveness, um, and they do also, also have some dosage information. The Natural Medicines website is something that I use probably every day that I'm at South Bay. Um, there's evidence-based information that's always updated. And my favorite thing about this website is that it lists all the medications that there could be interactions with. Um, so that one's a really good one. Examine.com is an independent organization that provides unbiased research on supplements and provides you know, other citations for more studies you can look at. Um, Consumer Labs um, is a paid service, um, but it does provide information on supplement quality, so it can provide information on brands, um, and that's something that Erica and I can look at for you. Um, the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center has a mobile app called About Herbs. Um, and it's really easy to look at the user. It's very user friendly, provides again that evidence based information that we're always looking for, for its usage, effectiveness. And again, if you don't want to look through these long websites with all this information, you can just bring the information, bring the names of um, things that you're thinking about taking to myself or Erica, and we're more than happy to look at it and kind of consolidate all that information for you. So to sum up, be careful. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I know um, we went, you know, we, we ended up having to talk about a lot of the things that are unsafe, um, but unfortunately that's the truth of what's, what the studies are showing us, that we, some things look really good and then, mm, or over here they're really good, but over here, not. So it just depends on where you fall, what medications you're on, really, um, other supplements that you're taking and that kind of thing. Um, so yes, things may be harmful, um, especially in high doses. Um, be careful, please, even with vitamins. Um, high doses can be um, not so good for you. Um, supplements um, do not have to be approved by the government, so it's 
it's unfortunate, and I hope that that changes um, eventually. Um, we're not recommending these supplements, simply sharing um, kind of the lack of and the often conflicting information. Uh, like I mentioned before, we're, we're advocates for you. Um, when somebody says, I, you know, I'm wondering, can I, can, can I, is there anything I should take? Is there anything, I, somebody told me I should take this. Sure, let's look into it and let's see if it's worth you know, something like that. I've also had, like I mentioned earlier, that if you do have a list of things and the doctor is like, oh, I don't know. Um, I've also had those conversations with the doctor. I'll look at it and I will go to the doctor. We do that. <laughs> we actually go to the doctor and we have conversations with them saying, these are the things that are okay, these are the things that are not okay, and then they'll say, oh, okay, well, you know, and then we make a decision together oftentimes. Um, it is very important to talk to your medical team about it. So please, um, I often sometimes uh, question when I am reviewing a chart and I only see like a few medications and that's all I see and I think, hmm, I have a feeling there's not a, there's not a multivitamin listed, there's not anything and I think, oh, I think somebody's forgetting to tell us something. Um, so we do our best to gather all that information and ask, um, and hopefully you tell us, um, so we can just keep you on the safe side. Um, food sources are likely safe and appropriate. Um, and, and then just stay tuned. Again, we are huge advocates for you. If there is something that comes up, um, we will be, we'll be passing it out. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> but. Um, Really, uh, we're just constantly looking for things that are going to help people get through chemo, help people not have to go through chemo again, um, and, and any of that, you know, to basically stop this adventure. Um, so, yeah. And other than that, um, thank you very much for coming. And if you guys have any questions, we can take those now. Yeah. Um, yes, um, yes, and, um, but again, more, more, we need more, yeah, that's, uh, there's nothing as far as that, you know, we can, yeah, I mean, I think there's actually quite a bit of the supplements, um, that are looking, um, at, uh, immunotherapy, and we just need more, it's, I, I'm not, at, you know, we're not at a point where we can, again, suggest, things that we're confident about and that, you know, is for that somewhat general, if that answers your question. Most of the comments were around chemotherapy yeah. and radiation, so I'm wondering if it's the same if it applies to immunotherapy. Yes. Research. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not so, I mean, you can imagine there's already limited research with a lot of the chemotherapies and radiation, so um, it's even less. Um, but again, there, the, the drive is there, and th you know, there actually are some studies underway looking at all of that. Yeah, good question. Anything else? Yeah. How do you know what brands are reputable, like even when it comes to multivitamins? Good question. Yeah, yeah. so going back to those labels, those seals of approval, um, those are reputable. Um, and then also Consumer Labs is another website. It's a paid for service, but Eric and I can log in and get information on specific brands of things that you're looking for. Like if I went to Walgreens or something and like was looking for like a multivitamin, would it, would there be items there that would have one yep. of those seals on them? Yeah. And, um, and I can actually, I am confident enough with certain brands that I, I can speak to that to some degree. Um, with multivitamins, the in, Interesting thing about a multivitamin is it does not, number one, have to be expensive, um, and it does not have to necessarily be some kind of specialty off-brand. Um, Consumer Labs, again, I spend a lot of time on there, um, they pick stuff off the shelves and then they test them, and whether it's a supplement or the multivitamin or anything like that, like Natalie mentioned, they test it to, number one, make sure that it has what it, the label says it has in there. Um, and then it also, they look for any contamination. Um, for multivitamins, things like the, uh, well, actually, they don't, they haven't, I think they tested Centrum once, but um, the one-a-days, the actually Kirkland brand, um, those actually have always turned out 
clean and what they say they, you know, they, they have in them, um, as well as the number of generic brands. So like your CVS, um, your Walgreens, um, those actually have come out clean. The things that have not, unfortunately, actually are some of the, um, like the food-based um, multivitamins, more so because um, they don't have, they end up not having exactly what it says it has in there, and it may be because, again, there's a question about that is once it's shipped, if they do their own testing and then it's shipped out, and if the dose is reduced because of time or, you know, things were left at a different temperature, so that kind of the degrading um, components of that. Um, other components, too, is, I mean, other brands, um, now tends to be a good brand. Jaro is, tends to be a, a very reputable, um, things like pure encapsulation. I mean, there's a lot of really great um, uh, brands out there that... Um, Nature Made also typically has the USP label. Yes, that's Nature a very Made. common one. Nature Made and the Nature Bounty, I think, yeah. is another one. That, again, you can find anywhere. And to everybody's surprise... It's, it comes, it's good. I mean, you know, I think people kind of walk into CVS and go, oh gosh, you know, or, you know, a, a drugstore and think, oh, these are probably not good. Again, it's a clean product. They break down. They also will test that to see if the product actually breaks down like it should. Um, and it, it passes. So good question also. Anything else? I have a question about flaxseed oil. Is that, would that be considered a supplement? It can. Um, it depends on how it's used. How much you're taking, or yeah, yeah. That again is not excessive. That's yeah. That is would be a little bit on the um, you know, whole food side, like I the think. whole food side, because you're not really yeah. It's not well, necessarily something. I mean, I take flaxseed oil, but I didn't think. Now that I'm looking at this. I'm yeah. what else I take, right? But it, yeah. Okay. yeah. So, but it's, it, it's always good to mention mm -hmm. because they can actually put it in there. They can actually still put it in your chart. They can put all that in there. So, yeah. That actually kind of triggers something. Um, how about apple cider vinegar? It's not really necessarily a supplement, but um, I know people use it for other purposes like to clean the system. So they do. Um, gosh, we should have put that on the list. I know. Um, I know, we couldn't capture everything. Uh, in, again, my first thought is how much are you doing? Because um, with apple cider vinegar too, that whole kind of dosing, and I even cringe to say that, um, because there's some things out there that are, you know, like a tablespoon, and then every once in a while I hear much more than that, and I can only just think of the digestive side effects of drinking a glass of that. But, um, uh, and there will be. Uh, but that's the other thing is there are those types of um, products that are kind of on the fence of where does that fall? Because it's, if it's a tablespoon or, you know, a quarter of, of a cup or something, nah. Um, you know, that's definitely not excessive. Um, but it's also important to bring it up yeah. and to possibly even using some of the resources and saying, okay, what else do I take? Is, is it conflicting with anything? And as far as claims of cleansing the body and like getting rid of toxins, we have lovely organs called your kidneys and your liver that do a wonderful job at doing that. So there's no need to drink. I don't know. Have you ever drank in apple cider vinegar? Oh, I try everything. Yeah, it's pretty gross. I do. <laughs> I'm a you know. Yeah. I take I take things. I try things, and yeah, because I want to be able to. When somebody asks me, I want to say, yeah. yeah. You know, it's kind of like when somebody says, "Have you ever drank it in Ensure?" And I said, mm -hmm. "Of course." <laughs> I know what they taste like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. did you have a question? Oh, I was just thinking about all oh. the probiotic drinks you see now too. Like, oh. oh. Yeah. Yeah. Probiotics, again, I think we could talk about that just for an hour, yeah. yeah. And I realize, actually, probiotics, they're actually putting that in some um, uh, 
uh, cottage cheese the, um, brands too. So yeah, they're kind of sprinkling probiotics everywhere, I think. So yeah, so that's, a, that's, that's another topic for sure, yeah. Any other questions that we can answer? Right? Is there a way that, like, we're at, that we can get in touch with you if we had questions? Yes, um, it, you can certainly um, talk to your, your doctor. That's the best way, yep, and um, ask, you know, ask for a referral and that kind of thing. And then, um, you know, we're always popping up, giving these talks, and, you know, we do keep in mind, in fact, when we were making the list of things, okay, what have people been asking about? What do people want to know about lately? Um, and, again, unfortunately, we couldn't cover everything because we'd be here all night. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so good question again. So yeah, talk to your doctor, um, your, your medical team, if uh, you know, you'd like a, a consultation, for sure. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Thank I you. appreciate it.